So let's get started. So Miru in her talk yesterday uh, during the honorary degree uh, ceremony talked about water and talked about not the 9 billion in 2050, but the 11 billion in 2100. So globally, how are we going to feed these people in 2100 or even 2050 with the 9 billion? You know, as population increases, as climate change occurs, we're really going to have to think of alternative ways of how to feed that population. And that's going to be the thesis of Miru's talk today. She's going to talk about various other things, about alternative sources of food. And so it'll be a wonderful talk. So let me talk to you a little bit about Miru. As you probably know, Miru for, is a great restaurateur. She's developed recipes and runs the kitchens at Viges and hailed by the New York Times as, quote, easily among the finest Indian restaurants in the world. She's not only a restaurateur, she's an author. She has penned Viges cookbooks, Viges, Elegant and Inspired Indian Cuisine, and Viges at Home, colon, Relax, Honey. <laughs> Gee, I think uh, somebody at home has actually read that book and talked to me about it. <laughs> and she's now working on her third book. And I think uh, the times I've met uh, Miru at Rangoli and at Viges, she's been hard at work on that manuscript. So uh, Miru, I think you're just about finished, or you have finished penning it? Finished penning it, so thank you. In, two th in 2004, they're all waiting for it, Miru. In 2004, Miru and Vikram opened their second joint restaurant, Rangoli, uh, the little sister to Viges. So let me tell you a little bit about Miru. Miru's on the board of directors for the Vancouver's Farmers Market and is a member of the Social Innovation Working Group and fundraiser for the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC Farm. Her special community project is an annual international food festival called Joy of Feeding, which features 15 home cooks of various ethnic backgrounds showcasing their family favorite comfort foods. It's a wonderful event. I had the opportunity to participate last year, and what a wonderful event it was. Her global vision is to have a worldwide Joy of Feeding Day where various communities throughout the world gather together to share their personal stories through their home-cooked meals. As I said yesterday, I had the pleasure to be at the graduation of LFS. And at that uh, ceremony, both Miru and Vikram were honored. I'm proud to call her a fellow UBC alumna now, as she was awarded her honorary degree yesterday, as I said. So please welcome Miru Dalwala to the stage. Do I use, this is good, right? Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming this afternoon. And um, one thing I'm not is a lecturer. And one thing I get away with as a restaurateur and a chef is that I can call myself a conversationalist. So I've got all of this here as any backup statistics and information in case you guys ask me a question. But what I'm going to do is close this or keep it to the side and start off the conversation with the triangle. Okay, it's here, the triangle. So one part of my job, which is a really creative part of my job, is um, I can do whatever I want. I'm my own boss. And I do spend a lot of time thinking about world peace. I had read an article ages ago about philosophers trying to come up with philosophical, mathematical formulas on how can we achieve world peace. And so I got to work on it myself. And this is the closest that I got. And so the way this works is this triangle it can be, it's going to be the basis of my conversation. And everything I say, I hope that you can really liberate it back to the triangle, is um, it could be either just one human being sitting right here, or it, that triangle could be replaced with this, the, our planet. So in the middle is body and soul. I can't find a better phrase. It's kind of cheesy sounding, but let's just use body and soul right now. It's, the quali it's your body and soul. It's the quality of who you are overall as a human being. Now, the three components that 
participate in just maximizing the quality of uh, body and soul, I'm going to start at the top, it's the environment. It's our planet. We don't have a planet. We've got catastrophes from climate change. We've got pollution. If we don't have a healthy planet, everything else is screwed. So I put that up on top. Um, to the right is nutrition. Nutrition is our own inner health. Uh, you know, getting cancer, illnesses, not getting in. It's our own personal inner health, our diet, vitamins, everything. And then to the left is culture. And culture is a very big triangle because in culture, I include basically everything, you know, uh, economic development, our actual different cultures, um, family life, cooking, food, everything we do as humanity amongst ourselves and with ourselves goes into culture. So uh, I'm going to use the number 11 billion, 2100, and how are we going to achieve this world peace, world peace triangle? Um, with 11 billion people. And Ricky, I'm not being facetious here, but I'm not going to say feed these people. I'm going to say feed our people because we are a part of the 11 billion people that we need to feed. And I think, um, and I'm going to be a bit cynical here, I think we do it in a very condescending way. How are we going to feed the people in the world? Whereas we don't focus about how are we going to feed ourselves? And when we're feeding ourselves and what we're eating, what we choose to eat, what are others not eating as a result of what we choose to eat? And whatever we do choose to eat, I think one of the things that we chefs do is we really grandi grand make, it, make food very grandiose and we're really into our truffle oils, we're really into being elegant. And um, while I enjoy it, I'm gonna be the first one to say that it's also pretty irresponsible of us chefs to do that. It's egotistical, it's irresponsible. And now as less and less people cook in the world, uh, at least in North America, as less and less people cook, we chefs need to take food very, very seriously. So um, in coming up, I've got three main food sources. I'm not going to talk about what we're already eating necessarily. I'm going to talk about three new food sources, but in the context of coming up with, okay, what are the three top food sources that I would recommend for our future, 2100, is... Um, two things. Water, number one, is what I touched upon yesterday uh, during the graduation ceremony. By 2050 even, we're going to need 50% more water than we're using right now today. And right now today, we're polluting water at such alarming rates that forget the 50% uh, more that we need in 2050, we're running out of water today. Now, in Canada, it doesn't look like it. It's really simple to go to dinner parties in Canada and talk about water and talk about hunger because we really aren't technically that affected by it. But if you go to Syria, and everybody knows what's going on in Syria right now, a lot, there's a lot of information out there kind of proving the fact that what drove the Syrians to revolt when they did revolt? It was a drought. It was lack of access to clean water. It was the fact that they could not grow their own food. That is what led to the Syrian crisis today. That was the lighter um, in terms of what ignited the whole thing. In, pa in Pakistan right now, people are, have access to 50% less water than they did when the country became independent in 1947. The rest of the world is suffering from a lack of water. And we're lucky that we've got the Atlantic Ocean. Maybe not lucky is not the right word, but okay, fine. We've got the Atlantic Ocean, right? And when we talk about floods of refugees as the child of refugee parents, I'm even offended by, by the word flood of refugees as if we're some morons um, on this planet who just don't, you know, we're a flood of refugees. No, we're human beings and we don't want to be refugees. We would love to live where we live. We would love to live where our culture is, where we're comfortable. If we had access to grow our own food, we had access to clean water and we had access to purchase the food in peace. So this flood of refugees that we're talking about are our people that we're going to also have to feed by 2050 and 2100 when it's 11 billion. So water is the biggest thing. Without water, it doesn't matter if Monsanto exists. Without water, it, doesn't, it just doesn't matter. Water is the most crucial thing, and it's going to be the deciding force of what we're going to be eating for our food. Okay, the next thing, which is also recently you know, new to me, is um, seeds. Who controls our seeds? Where is the seed coming from? 
And what happens if there is blight? What happens if there is some big fungus? What happens if we lose control over our seeds and we are unable to actually grow the food that we need to nourish ourselves? Now, it's not going to be a problem for um, wheat and corn and soy. That's, that's okay. Those three you know, food groups are taken care of. Um, but what about everything else? We've got yams in Africa. We've got a billion people in Africa that eat yams. And if I'm not, I'm not going to look at this piece of paper, let's check my memory here. Um, I think you've got six seed breeders of yams. If something happens to these yams in Africa, well, how, how, how is there going to be a new seed to replace the current seed that is undergoing some form of fungus or blight? Um, seed banks are in peril right now. And so the basket for seeds is in the Mediterranean, Iraq and, you know, uh, well, yeah, Greece, Iraq, that area, Mesopotamia is where our seeds originate. And um, for thousands of years, people have been storing seeds. And it's, you know, if there is some huge, I'm going to use the word illness, and we really don't have access, oh, sorry, and we don't have access to old ancient seeds that will provide the genetic resistance that we'll need to fight whatever is coming our way with climate change, we, again, we're, we're going to be in big trouble. So access to water and access to seeds and our ancient seeds. And I'm going to kind of go off on a little um, uh, tangent right now. Um, in Iraq, during the time that you know, the United States invaded Iraq, there is, a, there is a seed bank. There's a big, major, important seed bank in basements, in, um, in vaults in cold storage vaults of ancient seeds that had been stored there for a long time and maintained by scientists for a long time. These scientists risked their lives and they managed to smuggle these seeds to what they thought was a really, really safe place to keep them. That place happened to be Aleppo, Syria. So it's pretty unfortunate that, you know, a group of scientists in Iraq were, you know, smuggling seeds to safety, but they smuggled them to Syria and we already know what happened. Um, Years later, in Afghanistan and other places, seeds for walnuts, for plums, for almonds, for dates, all these seeds are, you know, they're, they're being lost and they're being destroyed because of war. So we will be touched by this. So water and seeds and 11 billion, those are the three things that I took into consideration when I came up with my food sources. So water, again, it goes into everything in terms of world peace. Seeds. Good seeds, good nutrition, good seeds we eat, good seeds, less pollution. Um, so the food sources, I'm going to save my favorite one for last, but number one, I'm going to talk about seaweed. Number two, I'm going to talk about in vitro meats. And number three, I'm going to talk about insects. I'm not saying that this is all we're going to be eating in some science fiction future, that you know we're going to be eating a bunch of seaweed and bugs and um, artificial meat. But these are three main food sources that are, we're gonna, I, I think we're going to have to research, we're going to have to open our minds about, and we chefs are going to have to take a lead on in terms of what are we going to do with it. So, can I take one of these off? Is it, use this one? Okay, I'll use this one, because I feel like I'm, I'm doing a double. So, um, seaweed is something relatively new for me. I just discovered it um, a month ago, probably. And, um, but I've been reading up on it a lot. So, hunger. We're not hungry necessarily because there's not enough food here. We're hungry because either people can't grow their own food or they can't purchase their own food. The power of food is very lopsided. Seaweed, it's free. It's in the ocean. And seaweed does not require fresh, clean water to grow. Um, the way seaweed works, it absorbs its own CO2, its own nitrogen, its own phosphorus. Uh, it's a great filter for cleaning the oceans. Uh, kelp farms we can grow along coastal, um, you know, around coastal communities. And co um, kelp farms actually help with shellfish as well for clams and oysters and everything. Um, Japan and China already, obviously, the Japanese and the Chinese and the Koreans do eat a lot of seaweed with their sushi. But most of the seaweed right now, about 28 million tons of it, is harvested for cosmetics, for shampoos, and for fertilizer. And seaweed on its own is, has twice as much vitamin C as oranges. It has way more calcium than milk. It's got uh, vitamin B12. It's got omega oils. 
It is a magic food. Right now, you can get it at Whole Foods and at nice little expensive um, grocery uh, uh, health food stores, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, seaweed also, you know what, coastal communities, it's just whoever is harvesting the seaweed can eat that seaweed. Seaweed also in Ireland, um, during the time of the famine, it's associated as, a, as something that you would eat when um, you're hungry, during hunger and famine. And again, you know what, 2100, maybe that is, that's where we're going to be in hunger and famine. But uh, again, going back to us chefs, seaweed is something that we could um, start cooking with. So I'm at Vidge's right now. It doesn't sound right to me either, but I'm working on a seaweed curry. Uh, my daughters at home have been trying a lot of seaweed recently. Uh, seaweed and uh, coconut palm sugar is fantastic in ice cream. We did a pasta and seaweed. We've done kale and seaweed. I've got to get rid of kale in everybody's psyche, not just me on my own, but we tend to, um, we find one thing and then we become obsessive over one thing. That's it. So right now everything is all about kale. And so we need to balance it all out. Um, so seaweed is going to replace kale a bit at the Vidge's uh, menu. And what I would like to do, but this is what's hard right now, is how do I get this seaweed and not pay the atrocious amounts of money that I have to pay for it to get it on my table? So it's out there in abundance, but then it's all about the power of who has the power of selling that seaweed. And we do in North America and Europe, we do get all cha-ching, 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 like, oh my God, at Whole Foods, I can sell this for, you know, $6.99. Or it's not just Whole Foods, it's just... We, our level of income earning and what we want to do is very, very different from the level of, I would say, the third world. But seaweed is one thing. Now, I'm working on a buttermilk curry. I found out that seaweed goes really well with onion and buttermilk and yogurt, and so I'm making a tangy curry. But instead of push, putting a beautiful sable fish in there, what I'm going to do is try and use different seaweeds. Now, I'm experimenting with it myself. It's, not a, it's, it's a brand new thing. You know, dulse has a different taste. Sea lettuce has a different taste and texture. Kelp has a different taste and texture. And um, to get a plate of it, that you do actually get the vitamins on it, um, how do I not seaweed you out? Um, so that's what I'm working on right now with seaweed. Now, the kind of disgusting thing, and I hope the conversation does lead to somebody, or I'm actually dictating it right now, um, I hope somebody does ask me afterwards, why is this any, or how is this not any different from Monsanto's and genetically modified foods, is in vitro meats. Now, in vitro meats is in something else that I've been looking into for about two years, but there's not a whole lot of information out there, and, and you know, it's, it, this is a hard one. This is a very long-term project, and um, I read an article in the New Yorker, I think it was a couple of years ago, and um, it was, I think he was... He was a prisoner of war in Japan, and his name is William Van, I've written it down, Elan Van Ellen. And one thing that he, or he realized when he was a Dutch prisoner in a Japanese camp was um, not only was he and other prisoners, not only were they starving like crazy, but even more than that, what they noticed is how bad the dogs and the animals were being treated by the Japanese. So on the one hand, he was starving, and on the other hand, there was this um, issue of um, animal welfare that he, you know, and he was looking at both of them together. And his background's in psychology, and then he became a medical doctor, but it stuck with him, is, um, you know, just the horrors of eating meat and animal welfare. And then there's another guy named Mark Post, and Mark Post, he's a, um, he is a pulmonary special, I don't know, he's a biologist. What did I say he was? A vascular biologist, and, um, and he's a surgeon. And so, Meat. <laughs> Let's talk about meat right now. 19% of our pollution towards greenhouse gases is in agriculture. Okay, so technically my field of, I'm not going to say restaurant, my field of agriculture, because my restaurants are dependent on agriculture. So my field contributes 19% of all greenhouse gases that are emitted on, you know, right now. Of this 19%, 75% of it is from animal and animal products and meat. Now, animals and meat and cheese, extremely, extremely water intensive um, food. Not sustainable, not just water intensive, but it pollutes the water that's, all, that's clean right now. So not only is it using up the water, it's also polluting the water. And if you go back to here and to our nutrition, it's giving us a lot of cholesterol and a lot of heart disease. And, um, 
that doesn't even include the antibiotics that's going into the meats. It's not including the hormones going into the meats. It's not including the, the disgusting feed that's going into the meat and the pollution from that meat that's going into our rivers and our lakes and our, and our oceans. So technically speaking then, if we're not all gonna go vegetarian, because that's the other option, is we can just all go vegetarian by 2015. And when I say vegetarian, I mean getting rid of cheese as well. So if we don't wanna do that, then we need to look into this whole idea of in vitro meat. It needs to get a better name. <laughs> you know, we're not going to call it in vitro meat. But the other thing is, um, let's just start from the beginning of it. Yeah, you know what? Everything is disgusting when you're starting to do research on it. But we've become so detached from um, where things begin. So, you know, if I've given you a chicken and it looks so beautiful on your plate at Vidges and you want to take your eye camera out and you want to take a picture of it, well, you know what, that chicken didn't look that pretty right when it was getting slaughtered, right? That's disgusting as well. So uh, in vitro meat came from this idea of animal welfare, and it came from the idea of, um, like what I was just talking about, about the role of meat in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and polluting. So where does it start? The, the, the compound in which it's grown, it's basically muscle. Meat is muscle. They've only managed to create a piece of meat the size of a contact lens right now. So it's not something that I as a chef can just Google and say, hey, I want to try your meat. Um, I really hope as a chef that I can do that one day. The first meat that they're going to work on is hamburger. Um, hundreds of gallons of water go into just one hamburger right now. And not just one hamburger like that, but the cow, the whole process. So. You know, I was sitting there complaining to my children a couple of weeks ago that we have to give up almonds because one almond takes two gallons of water. No more almonds, girls. And in the meantime, Nanaki's using up the almonds and making almond butter at home. But um, the, uh, one hamburger, hundreds of gallons of water go into that. So the first artificial meat that they're trying to create is, um, is hamburger meat. It's all happening in the Netherlands right now. And I'm not sure why people aren't putting more money into this. And when you take this, the idea is that you take one cow and the stem cells, because that's, that's what grows really, really fast, is you take the embryonic, the stem cells of one cow, and this is a very grandiose goal, but it could happen with one cow in a bioreactor in very, very pristine conditions, you recreate enough meat of a million cows. And um, it is science fiction sounding, but at the same time, uh, why is it science fiction sounding? I think it's an amazing idea. And I, I mean, I would love it if I could propose to my government, which, okay, I just might do that, is, you know, where are our scientists in Canada and America? And why is it happening just in Netherlands? And, you know, I don't think Noma should be the only restaurant that tries all this new stuff. I think, you know, Vidges should be able to try. I mean, all restaurants should be trying all of this stuff. So um, in vitro meat, and again, you know, we can come up with better names and then send it off to the people in Netherlands. Um, but in vitro meat has, I think it has to be another option. Uh, vegetarianism would be great, but um, India and China, I mean, obviously we know that that's where a big chunk of that 11 million is going to um, come from. And I can tell you about us Indians, you know what, the richer we're getting, the more westernized our diets are getting. Uh, India was about 80% vegetarian as a country at the time of partition, and now it's 50% vegetarian. And one thing I don't support is like a three-tier uh, system of living. You know, you can't have our first tier, which I call, and I was talking about yesterday, the luxury livers. And that's us. We live in luxury. We live in absolute, just what I'm doing right now with these lights on and it's raining outside. I'm not wearing a sweater because the, I guess the heat, and we're, we're luxury livers, right? Then you've got that second tier, which I would say are the middle class livers of the world. Um, and then you've got the, and I don't like this word either, but you've got the people who are living at the bottom, the bottom one billion people who are going hungry. We cannot come up with a system in which, just because we can, the one billion people which is going to go up are just delegated to dinner party intellectual conversations and for liberal people to talk about world hunger. And I go to fundraisers and... Um, you know, and I donate 500 bucks here and I donate $50 there, that's not going to solve that problem. You know, um, philanthropy is great, but it makes us great. It's not solving any problems of the world. I don't think that, you know, what we can um, 
that the poor are going to be able to lift themselves up because of great dinner parties that I hold and fundraisers that I hold at Vidji's restaurant. It's going to have to be, the system's going to have to change, and uh, people are going to be able to hopefully afford it all. So, um, that, okay, so that's my reason right there. And um, I just got sidetracked because I thought of something else of the yams in Africa. I was in, I was in Kigali. I was in Rwanda last summer at this time. And um, it was amazing there when you see how people are eating and uh, how you eat. And people automatically assumed when I was there that I wanted to eat processed junk food. Everybody assumed that I would not want to eat Rwandan cuisine. And food does grow plentifully in Rwanda, and it's beautiful. And the food was so simply made that I was almost feeling ashamed of just how much I decorate my food. But food decoration is going to be a big part at the same time when it comes to seaweed and when it comes to the in vitro um, meat. So in vitro meat, food decoration, in terms of that, then is going to switch over to the third thing that I talk about which I do have experience with, which is insects. And uh, insects are not so new. And I think a lot of you sitting here have heard me talk about insects before. Um, at Vidge's, I think it was out in 2008, 2009, I had read an article in the New York Times Magazine. And the, at the end of the article, it talked about um, eating, in, eating bugs is the equivalent to your body, nutrition, and to the environment, right? Eating insects is the equivalent of riding a bicycle, and eating a six-ounce uh, beef steak is the equivalent of riding a, or driving a big SUV. And that was the clinch sentence for me in terms of, okay, let's get to work on the insects. I didn't know what to do, but uh, I called up the guy who was featured, David Gracer. I, I found his number on the internet back then, and I called him up, and he actually picked up the telephone, and he was just giddy that someone even phoned him up to talk about um, you know, eating uh, bugs. Then he gave me, and I was, it was intellectual at the time, and so then he gave me uh, the number and name of David George Gordon, who happened to be based in, uh, in Seattle. And so I called him up, and, and David uh, George Gordon, who will be at Joy of Feeding, by the way, on June 25th, uh, with his bug booth is what I'm going to call it. Um, so he, you know, I talked to him and he's, yeah, he talks like this and he's really laid back about everything and uh, yeah, I do, I do bugs and I'm excited and I said, okay, can you come to Vidji's restaurant and you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get bugs on my menu and so he shows up and, um, and then the intellectual changed to emotional when I saw these little crawly things <laughs> like this in various little plastic containers and my armpit starts sweating like crazy and I realized, like, what the F have I gotten myself into? <laughs> and, um, and then he's got crickets, and he's got mealworms, he's got these white wax worms, uh, grasshoppers, and, uh, and it's a shock. It, it really is a shock, and the reason why I can talk about this is because I went through the shock as far as the bugs were concerned. And um, he holds it out to me, and it's a live white wax, wax worm, and he goes, uh, here, try one. And I thought to myself, no. <laughs> Uh, no, this is what I actually throw across the room when my lettuce, organic lettuce from the farmer's market has it. And, um, but at the same time, here I was doing it, and so I did the stupidest thing in the world. Is No, it's not that stupid, but uh, I don't even, I'm an atheist, but I prayed to God and said, okay, God, if I eat this bug, the promise is that nothing bad is ever going to happen to my children. And so I made that promise, and I took that wasp worm, and I put it in my mouth, and I just popped in my mouth like a grape, and I was like, ugh, disgusting. And then to make sure that I wasn't afraid to do it again, I hurried up, and I grabbed another one, and I put it in my mouth. And the second time that I ate it, it really did have a very mild pistachio grape-like flavor to it. <laughs> my fear of bugs went away forever. And um, then I thought to myself, okay, you know what? Doing it like this is just not going to work. I've got to come up with a way to make eating insects, you know, palatable. So we talked about the health of seaweed. We're going to, we kind of talked about the health of meat, in vitro meat, in terms of protein and not polluting. Now, bugs, extremely, extremely healthy for you in terms of protein, in terms of iron, in terms of omega oils. And um, bugs don't require that same intensive farming. And um, I love this bit of information. The feces of bug, bugs is very clean. 
And so uh, Dean Murray Isman of Le uh, Faculty London Food Systems, he was another one of my advisors when I was cooking with the crickets. And I noticed when I got these box of crickets, there was a lot of poop at the bottom. And being in the restaurant business and having a health inspector that con you know, hovers over, he was like, what, what am I going to do with this? But it's such an embarrassing question. And Murray, uh, Dean Isman, uh, he said to me that bugs have an abs a completely different digestive system. So when we're talking about eating flies, and we already know what flies eat, we don't, you know, you can imagine. When we're talking about flies, when we're talking about crickets, and we talk about all bugs, their di digestive system is just completely different from animals. You can't get avian flu from eating an insect. You can't get um, SARS from eating an insect. You can't get swine flu from eating, uh, not, uh, yeah, from eating an insect. Bugs are clean, and bugs are healthy, and a lot of the world already eats bugs. Whether they have to or whether they enjoy it is not the point, but they are eating those bugs. And again, as a chef, my job is to make sure or to try to help you all to make eating bugs more palatable. And so I ground up the crickets the first time. And I ground them up and I put them into a flatbread and I combined them with turnips and tomatoes and because that's what tasted good. Now, on its own, a cricket does not taste good. But I will tell you what does taste good on its own. I, was, um, I had an email from a guy named Chris. And Chris is working on bullet soldier, bullet soldier flies, the larva of bullet soldier flies. And he's working on making food products with this larva. Now, it sounds absolutely disgusting, right? The larva, I'm not even sure how I would put it on my menu, right? Uh, larva, you know, fly larva. But, um, <laughs> But it's something, you know, but it keeps me creative. It keeps my job fun. And uh, Chris brought it over for me to try. And um, this was actually good. Unlike the cricket that I really have to decorate, uh, this, the larva, the fly larva was actually delicious. But in our psyche, it looks disgusting. And so that's what I'm working on. I'm working on seaweed curry. I'm working on insects. I'm really, really dying to get my hands, or not in my hands, I should take that back, but you know, not, to meet some of these scientists working on in vitro meat. And um, my next dream is to just get a sample of in vitro ground meat and, um, and try it out. And I want to get other chefs on board, but you know what? We chefs listen to our customers because we're running a business. So as customers, as people, as citizens, you all need to start paying attention to your food and don't cut us a break as chefs. You know, don't get all hee hee ha ha, get my cell phone out and you know, uh, be all elegant about the eating. Speak out about the food and think about something healthy. It's not just about your body's nutrition, right? Think about this in terms of the entire planet's nutrition and where that food comes from. So thank you, everybody. All right here. Okay. Well, thank you, Miro. You're never disappointing. You know, we had a conversation last week about, you know, what should my talk be about? And I said, well, you know what, Miro? You know, be informative, be questioning, be inspiring. And I think she hit all those buttons. So thank you, Miro, for just a well, superb thank you. talk. Thanks. Now, as I try to figure out this technology, um, we'll ask for questions from the floor. And Fred, I'm looking for you to be the person that will probably help me out here, Fred. OK. I saw a hand over here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, OK, so you were, wait, I forgot it. OK, so when people started eating meat, it was like a really good thing to do. So do you not think that like eventually getting like eating insects will become so normal that it'll kind of turn into like the equivalent of what meat is today? Well, that's that's the goal, but it's not going to happen until we also get rid of our weebie jeebies about eating bugs. And we also kind of become open minded about asking chefs and grocery stores about whether or not they stock edible insects and start experimenting ourselves with it as well. I just have to say that was a really nice experience to be asked a question by my daughter in the audience. Okay. <laughs> that I was planted. really worried that yeah. she was going to 
<laughs> ask a really hard question or something. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, Fred, you do that. Okay. Uh, what are your concerns when it comes to, say, marketing these new products um, on a global scale like seaweed or, say, insects catch on to, say, the state that quinoa has and the impact that it has on the cultures that depend on that as their sole food source? So that's actually happening in Ireland right now with seaweed. Um, so uh, in Northern Ireland, in the county of Mayo, Ireland, uh, people, farmers have been harvesting their own seaweed for a long time. And seaweed is catching on. This is not something brand new that I've discovered, you know, but seaweed is catching on. Um, about 9 million tons of it is used in human consumption right now. And so now the Irish farmers are, have been harvesting their own seaweed. And now there's a big uh, problem right now with the Inv Irish in uh, Ministry of Environment and there is a Canadian multinational corporation that wants to buy the rights to the seaweed of the Irish coast. So um, in a way, it's, a, it's, a hor it's not a good thing, but in a way, it's, hum we human beings are so bizarre, it takes a crisis to bring something to our attention. So. Um, yeah, it, I am concerned about it, but let it happen. Like, let this problem happen versus not happening is the way I see it. Great. Before we take a question from the audience, I figured out the technology. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, uh, Miru, how about fish? And what are your thoughts about fish? Okay, so my thoughts about fish. If I had it my way, but my managers will not allow this, I would not be serving fish on, my rest on any of my restaurant menus right now. Everything is overfished. Um, Everything is, it's not just about humans eating fish. It's also about fish eating fish. It's about the whole thing about predators in the oceans. Uh, if we have it our way, and again, we just can't make that assumption that we in North America can eat a certain way and expect the poor people to eat in another way. We can't make that assumption that, um, you know, there's different tiers of eating. And so um, if we keep going, we're, we're going to have a dead ocean in about another 40 years. And so... Another one of my little Lala fantasy projects or fantasy ideas is that we just, you know, stop eating fish worldwide. There's a UN body, that, uh, some international police body that watches us. We just give the oceans a rest for a couple of years. And people who are fishermen, you know, the people who are fishing right now for a living, right, we give them work to become stewards of the ocean. And we let the ocean replenish itself for a while. So um, fish is something that, you know what, whether there's, we think, we're, oh, we're all so great because it's ocean-wise. We're beyond ocean-wise. We're beyond Monterey Bay. And my, I do a lot of reading on this. And I think we just kind of avoid it because we're also told that fish is so healthy for us. But I would actually, if I could, I don't eat fish in my personal life. Um, maybe twice a year I will because I've drunk too much alcohol and I forget about my dietary um, uh, desires or whatever. But um, I, I, I personally, I, I would recommend, I would love it if there was a fish moratorium. She's human, everyone. She's human. <laughs> Here's a question that I often get asked, uh, Miru, but I'm going to ask you. Your thoughts around GMOs. Okay. My thoughts around GMOs. I came out, you know, just two years ago, I campaigned with Jerry of Ben & Jerry's ice cream in Washington State for, their, um, for the referendum on labeling GMOs. I'm a huge, huge proponent of labeling GMOs. But I now, the more I research, and if we go back to what I said about water, right? Water is the most important thing. And so I do not anymore just put one big black X on all GMOs. If, um, if let's just say Montano, Mon Montano, Monsanto does come up, you know, with a seed varietal that uses 50% less water, uh, we may not have a choice. So I do not think that all GMOs are in one horrible category. Uh, I'm not necessarily a supporter of GMO myself, but I don't think that we should just sit there and avoid it because we may not have the luxury of avoiding it. At the same time, I just want to add, uh, Monsanto, you know, one of the big things they say is that GMOs are the only way to feed the world. They're not really producing at that level to feed the world, right? I'm more concerned not about GMOs, but who controls. It goes back to the seed. Right? Who mm -hmm. controls that seed? Okay. I'm looking at my floor director, Fred. Do we have time for a few more questions? Okay, great. I, I see a question at the back. Uh, 
Wait, 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 wait. It will get you I the like microphone. I'm on the yep. Show here. Uh, looking at how uh, people make change and and how we will, as a population will uh, will receive information, uh, we usually have to be forced into something. Uh, uh, we won't do it willingly. We won't see it clearly. Uh, uh, and um, in, the, in, the, in the recent past, in the last few months particularly, whenever I go to the meat market, I go into hard arrest because of the increases in prices. And, uh, and I've seen our meat uh, uh, purchases go down. I'm wondering how you're seeing that, because as a business person in a restaurant, you're fighting costs all the time. Mm -hmm. And you're fighting price points on your restaurants. Mm -hmm. how is, is this affecting you in the restaurants? Uh, and, and the kinds of things people are ordering, or uh, how, because you, know, you have to figure out some way to deal with getting that dish out at a price that's going to work, and that's going to be the thing that forces this kind of a population mm -hmm. to change. Well, um, the bane of my existence financially is that lamb popsicle dish at Vidge's. It's um, it's the most popular dish on the menu. People from all over the world come to Vidge's to try out that lamb popsicle dish. But rack of lamb is so expensive right now that I'm not making any money on that dish. It's become more of a marketing dish for Vidges than an actual, I'm losing money on that lamb popsicle dish. So meat prices are going up, but at Vidges and at Rangoli, I have not seen a decrease at all in people ordering meat. Uh, and my prices are going up and it shocks me every single time. Like, wow, it almost doesn't matter how much my price point goes up, but people are still ordering meat. It might be because Vidges is a higher-end restaurant. So I'm not getting a lot of students unless the students' mom and dad are taking them out to eat at, um, at, at Vidges. But at Rangoli, which is my mid-level restaurant, the price of meat is going up as well because I'm using, like I use the rack at Vidges and I use the leg at, um, at Rangoli. The price is going up, but I'm still not noticing a change. In, I'm not noticing that change in people ordering less meat. So. I'm not sure what, I'm, you know, this is it. I mean, this is why I'm giving this talk right now, is uh, my menu prices are going up as for all of my meats, but it doesn't change the amount of meat being ordered. When my menu prices go up because I've got local, organic, sustainable um, produce on my menu, people order less of it. So in my own business, I'm not seeing the change in my customers that I wish to see. Does that answer your question? Or? Well, the other thing is it's not just about vidges um, or, or the restaurants. It's also what are people doing at home? So if it turns out that, you know what, most people at home are cooking way more vegetarian food and people at home are being way more careful in terms of what they're eating and where it's coming from, and then they treat themselves when they go out to eat. Now, that's a model that could work, right? I just don't know right now what people are eating at home. And again, going back to Joy Feeding and that triangle, I really want to stress that we cannot stop cooking at home. Cooking at home is part of the culture. Cooking at home, that's where you can afford to be ethical, really, is when you're cooking at home. You can't necessarily be ethical when you come to my restaurant because of all the markup of food costs, my overhead costs, my labor costs, right? So cooking at home really is the biggest environmental act that you could do. I mean, come to my restaurant as well, but... <laughs> That was a free plug, by the way. <laughs> well, this may be a good segue, and I'm going to go back to the technology. Uh, Miri, you identified probably some of the socioeconomic challenges with regards to looking at future food sources. So the question was, how can leading countries provide food sources to less developed countries? Okay, provide. Uh, whoever asked that question, what do you mean by provide? Sell? Donate? Give? Um, what is by, I can give my own definition of provide. Sure, why don't you start off there? And okay, so my, how can we provide? Um, uh, it has to be affordable, and uh, it's, it has to be affordable, and providing the technology maybe, if it is, let's say, in vitro meat, um, it's not just providing the food itself, it's providing the know-how of that food. Because everybody knows about, you know, um, like, 
you know, bananas in Costa Rica, like the banana republics, let's go to that. You know, um, you can't just be dependent on importing your food from one place. You have to be able to grow your own food and you have to have the money to buy food from elsewhere. So uh, sharing is a better word than providing. So sharing means to grow. Sharing means of, you know, whatever the seeds and everything. That's what we're going to have to do is share a lot of the technology I think and teach. Necessary. You know, we're edu we've got more scientists here, you know, going there, not doing it for the poor people, but getting in there and teaching. Yeah, I think, Miri, one of the challenges is the pricing system of food. And you talk about, you know, what we should be feeding people, which are the healthier choices. And for argument's sake, we'll use fruits and vegetables and, you know, not the junk food stuff. But the price structure of food is... Why is it that we can buy four liters of milk at a price that's way higher than four, prices, uh, four liters of pop? Well, and um, things like that, right? Well, I wouldn't compare yeah, milk. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't yeah. care, uh, compare. Uh, well, pop is yeah. coming from Coca-Cola yeah, yeah. and Pepsi, and that's, uh, that has to be a whole different topic yeah. of, uh, of conversation. But um, if we, you know, we love to talk about organic food. We love to talk about, and I'm you know, on the farmer's market board, organic, sustainable food, uh, it's not going to catch on. It's not going to make a difference. And there's no way we can compete with corporate industrial food, which is much, much cheaper, unless governments get behind the whole idea of organic and small farmers. 75%, by the way, 70 to 75% of the people in the world are still living off of food grown on small farms. So the role of small farms mm -hmm. is not diminishing in, in other countries. It's diminishing in North America. So um, milk prices, right? If you want to compare mm -hmm. it to pop, milk has to be more expensive than pop. It, 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 ne it needs to be. But at the same time, uh, governments also need to figure out what foods are going to subsidize, right? Mm -hmm. And what foods are not going to subsidize. And that's, again, in terms of us as voters, getting out there and asking more questions and making more demands of the government um, in terms of subsidies. Yeah, I guess when you're faced with trying to get calories into your family, you look for cheaper sources of food. And some of those cheaper sources probably aren't the best choices. No, they're not. Yeah, yeah. And uh, not just cheaper, yeah. but cheaper also means more polluting. Yeah. Right? We have to remember that. You know, if you leave with two things, number one, water is the biggest problem we're going to face. And number two, agriculture and food. 19% of our overall pollution and our greenhouse gas emissions comes from our choice of what we eat. So I'm going to go back to the technology and uh, I see that Fred is saying that we have a few seconds left. Uh, seaweed is, a great, uh, is great for carbon sequestration also, so mm -hmm. a win-win. Yeah. Um, do you see this as an industry or more as a wild foraging source of food? And I think you, you made reference to that just shortly. Both. Yeah. I see it as both. Like mushrooms, right? Mushroom is an industry. Mushroom would be my number fourth, uh, number four food source. Um, and you harvest from mushrooms. So as far as seaweed, hopefully you can get gourmet Irish seaweed. And um, you can also get seaweed that's grown elsewhere at a much cheaper price. We have time for probably one more question from the audience, or, or the final two questions, I guess, will come from there. Sorry. Hello. Your perspective has been really interesting. I'd love to hear kind of your ideal plan of action in terms of um, education, um, government policies, and uh, generally, you know, how to implement that kind of pyramid mindset into all individuals, and also these three food sources that you have. Well, the first one is joy of feeding. Uh, it's held here at UBC Farm, and that's the way I'll do it for myself, and just promoting joy feeding, and it's, you know, about that triangle. The next thing is, uh, what is everybody out here, I mean, I, we all have to do it together, and how am I a leader? Well, my pedestal is cooking and food, and so what I'm doing right now with Ricky is I'm trying to get all the deans together at UBC. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I can't just focus on one small you know, just the food people. Like, you know, we have to have conversations with people outside. And so I spoke to the Dean of Forestry, the Dean of Arts. Well, we've got land and food systems here. And um, it doesn't matter what your profession is, but we need to come together and talk about this whole topic, which impacts all of us. So um, 
The other thing I'm doing is getting the deans involved and figuring out with the deans, how can we do our another version of joy of feeding, but it's a joy of learning, or not, maybe not joy, but we, <laughs> names are an issue for me. Um, so getting the deans out there to figure out how to get their faculties involved um, on this issue. I was just talking to Sapporo uh, in the green room, is how can the two of us get together and, um, and talk about renewable energies, talk about agriculture, and one small little sideline to that is what we spoke about is, you know, there's something new and compelling now. It's not just men out there talking. Now you've got, may I say this, middle-aged women, <laughs> um, <laughs> right, who have experience. And now you've got women out there talking about this. And I just think it's more compelling the more variety of people you have talking about um, some very compelling issues that we really don't have a lot of time to um, not deal with right away. And the final question, I think, Amanda, you had no question? Okay, thank you very much. So with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Miro, as I said, you're never disappointing. And again, when we were chatting last week, and I said, Miru, how many PowerPoint slides are you going to have? And she said, one. I go, thank goodness. One of the most inspiring talks I've heard is from her because Mira's a great storyteller. And I think you'll all agree, she has some strong messages to bring forward that we need to really think about. So thank you very much, thank Miru. You. I also wanted to thank my colleagues at Alumni UBC, Fred for being the, uh, the stage manager, uh, the colleagues at Alumni UBC, my staff, and Land and Food, thank you very much. I also want to thank the audience for being here with us, especially on this rainy day. And so thank you very much. Enjoy the rest. Thank you.